Boy, Paul lays out uh, some interesting scriptures here for us to unpack. The lectionary has it right here in the middle of this three-part series about love. And so, so very much so, let's start with uh, a moment of prayer. Well, precious Lord, on this Holy Sunday, help me to speak your word with faithfulness, with clarity, authority, and passion, as well as with wisdom, humility, and liberty. It is of your love. The words are shaped and shared for the sake of the gospel. It is meant to go out and touch all people by all means. So Holy Spirit, I empty myself. Touch my lips, fill me, fill us with your word that transforms our lives and glorifies you. Amen. It is, it's, it's, it's a deep thing, and B, you're spot on. It's so challenging. Love seems so universal, so simple. And we talk about God's love, the, the greatest love, the almighty love. And then we have a scripture like this when it's talking about law, not law, whether you are under it or whether you're weak. It's, but he closes with, for all, sake, for all things, the sake of the gospel, we will partner together. And I think that's the message in this. I know when I try to study it and read it and find, find grounding in it, I need to go to, well, my literary sources, my, my things in the library. Uh, I've got to be honest. And it's always good to be honest when you're doing the sermon. I'm not what I would call a literary nerd. That's, no. When I was in a library, if I had to be in a library, I think of that middle school library that when I was there, I didn't go to those old dusty books. No, no, I went straight to the record section and I'd go rifling through those LPs until I got that Steppenwolf album out. Slide that big black disc out of that sleeve, spin it over, make sure I had the right side up. We had a portable record player. It would almost fit on this pulpit and you pick up that needle and you set it so carefully on the fifth, on the fifth track and Born to be Wild would come roaring through. Yes, those cost stereo phones on my ears, I had it as loud as I could get it. I was one Born to be Wild seventh grader. That's kind of my idea of literature. And it's not that I didn't like any literature. There is some. I, uh, I like Joseph Conrad, that's his English name, and I remember, I've, I felt like I got caught one time coming back on a, from a wrestling tournament on a bus, and one of my teammates saw me reading Victory, and somehow, I, I don't know why, but I explained it away as saying I needed it for an assignment. So Conrad wasn't the only one. I also like Charles Dickens. I know why I like Charles Dickens. His second book is Oliver Twist. Oliver, it opens early, early in that three-part saga, and in the movie, it starts with the fact that you had this orphan in an orphanage. Now, while Oliver was nine, you need to know that I went into an orphanage just before I turned three. And so I know why I related to an orphanage. And in that, you know, I have very, very few memories at three, you know, not quite being three years old. For one, I remember being on the third story of that place there on the Mississippi River in Iowa and looking down on the playground, for you see my older sister, my sister was a year older, and she was down on the playground. I didn't get to see her very often. The boys were on the third floor, their dormitories, and the girls were on the second floor. And so I missed seeing my sister. And so Oliver has a certain affinity for me. I like how when we go to talk about God's love and how to live into it and look at, see it, and touch it, how Oliver Twist does it. The picture you see right now happens to be where he's already asked the big question. We all know this one. I'm sure you do. If you didn't know it's from Oliver Twist, you'll recognize it. Please, sir, may I have some more? And of course, what does Mr. Brimble, 
the gentleman that we see in the picture, what does he respond? More? Yeah. Now, I have to say that I had good experience in the orphanage and was adopted less than a year later. But I still connect to Oliver Twist. First of all, you need to see the rest of the set. What is the rest of the picture? Oh, if you can see it there on your phone or your PC or your television, you realize that look at how many boys are in that one room. And it's dark. It's gray. Uh, it's pretty bleak. The, they did a great job building that set. And just it's almost dismal. I don't know. If you're looking closely, can you see what's on that back wall? There's something written on back wall. It's really hard to see, isn't it? Perhaps this will help. That back wall in that dingy dining room says God is love. There in the Oliver Twist dining room. Hmm. In the grayness of the moment, what was happening around them, what they thought tomorrow would bring, and yet God is love. And I think of how true that is for us today. That in that grayness, in a time of COVID, in a time of racial unrest and political uncertainties that, that abound and economic concerns, and obviously ones of health, health, literally life and death, grayness that washes over us. To know, while they meant that as irony on that back wall, the reality is, is that it's still true, even in those gray times. God is still love, which is part of what Paul is trying to bring to us. For us to know that no matter where we are, who we're with, we are to be about the gospel for the sake of the gospel. We are to partner. As James referred to it last week, no matter where we are, where we are in that 99, we need to be part of finding the one that's not the one that doesn't feel part of the flock, the one that has wandered away, the one that has no idea that a flock even exists. It's amazing over the centuries and over the timelines how something like that can be so true. Like I said, I was almost, almost three. I was three and a half when I was adopted. And fortunately, my sister was adopted with me. I think of that. I have two granddaughters that are within weeks of that exact same age. I, I look at them and I think that's when God is love became a rainbow of vibrancy for me. It just, the, the overwhelming love beyond my own ability to understand the change just to know and nestle in the loving arms of a mother and father. And I think, how do I share that with others now? Across the timelines, we get so lost in where we are today and we have a hard time looking to tomorrow. And Paul is reminding us that it doesn't matter where we are and whose we are, who we're with. A year ago, a year ago on February 7th, we had 12 confirmed cases of COVID in the U.S. Yeah, I'll let that one sink in. February 7th, we had 12 confirmed cases. And by the way, there were many that put that in doubt that that wasn't really true, there was none in the U.S. I go back three and a half years trying to deal with different chunks of time. You go back to August of 2017, we were reeling from what had happened in Charlottesville, Virginia. All of us were just shocked and abhorred by what had happened. We knew there were lessons to be learned, things that could be changed that surely would never happen in the U.S. That's, those kinds of things just don't happen. People don't die because they stand up and say, this is what I think, this is what I hope for, this is what I believe. Hmm. And yet Paul is reminding us that he didn't send us out to go change the whole world. No, he sent us out to do the little things. Whether we're weak or strong, whether we're with the law, not with the law, whether we're Jewish, not Jewish, it's amazing how he changes and adapts it. But that sensation of going out and doing God's call is like all of a sudden rushing along and realizing you're on the rim 
of the Grand Canyon. Glorious, wonderful, called to serve, called to do things in the name of God and realizing one more step and I can fall hundreds if not thousands of feet. It's beautiful what I see out across this. Whether I'm on the south rim or the west rim, it's just such a beauty to behold, but I don't know where to move my feet. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And Paul is reminding us to adapt and go ahead and do it. That's the thing about this scripture is that it, Paul in these 8th, ninth, and 10th chapters, 8th chapter last week, and I hope you go on and read chapter 10. It's this understanding that it's not all about us. He's not asking us to change, not to be who we are, but he's asking us to make sure that we understand who the person across from us is. It's not a confrontation, it's the desire and the willingness to create a relationship with that one that is opposite of us, the one that we may not understand. He calls us to be more Christ-like. If you think about it, that's what Christ did. You go to the third chapter of John, and who opens that chapter? Nicodemus knocking on the door at night. A Pharisee in the middle of the night. And Jesus welcomes him and has a conversation. The very next verse is the one we probably know and so often don't associate with the conversation in the middle of the night with the Pharisee. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Yes, that's the story of Nicodemus. That's Christ sharing God's grace with the Pharisee. The very next chapter, it's not another Pharisee, a person that's very upright and knows the Jewish law. No. It's the fourth chapter. It's the woman at the well. How opposite can you get? You go from Nicodemus to the woman at the well. And why was she at the well in midday, at noon? Because that's when it would be empty. No one else would be there. All of the proper people would have already been there and gotten their water. Those ladies would have come and gone already. The chance she would run into someone was next to zero. But here we are going from the third chapter to the fourth chapter. And Christ simply sits down and talks with both. Oh, if you knew who you were talking with, is as Christ puts it. And it doesn't just end there. You think of the 8th chapter in Matthew when you go on to the centurion, which meant he was in charge of more than 100 men. He was an officer in the Roman army. Well, first of all, he's Roman. I mean, really, are we going to deal with the Romans? And how did the centurion approach Christ? I'm not worthy. Just, just say it from here. You don't have to go to my home, to my friend back in my house. No, you don't have to do that. Just say it, and he'll be rid of his paralysis. Hmm. So we're asked to go and be more Christ-like. And then, of course, there's the washing of the feet. Jesus did not wash 11 disciples right this is a story from passion week when christ christ knows what's getting ready to happen within 24 hours and he humbles himself in the greatest way possible taking off his robe using a towel and showing the greatest act of love washing the feet of those near him. I want you to think of your 12 closest friends. What would be their reaction if you said, I want to come to your home and wash your feet? Hmm. 
It's almost easier to wash the feet of somebody you don't know. But Christ was trying to show the greatest love to those closest to him. And yet, they still struggled to understand. But that's part of what we're called to go and do. Paul says we do it for the sake of the gospel. We don't do it to make ourselves better. We don't do it to be rewarded. In fact, as he opens that, those verses that Brock read, it's just the opposite. It's the fact that we shouldn't get paid. We shouldn't get any recognition. We should do it because it's the right thing to do. It's for the sake of the gospel. It's the sharing the good news, the greatest gift. Oh, it's the greatest gift, and we get to go and show, share it, and we don't decide who. It's whoever crosses our paths. It's the one sheep, it's the other 99. It's the ones we already know, the ones we've never met. It's the ones we would tell ourselves we would never do that. But like I said, there we are. We didn't do the popular way. We didn't end up on the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. We might, have, we might have had the longer, tougher journey to get to that Grand Canyon. We might have ended up on the West Rim, which isn't near as popular, and we still don't know what to go do. I see it. I want it. I cherish it. I hear it. I know it. Here's this glorious panorama of God's creation. I still don't know what to do to get to the other side. And Paul is telling us, to do what we can, to do what we, God will make possible for us. Henry Nowen, a Dutch Catholic priest who uh, was in Canada at the time of his death uh, some 25 years ago, had these questions. You may have heard these questions before. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions. He puts those together, and I love the fact when he goes, there's so many things we ask ourselves, and what are we called to do, and how are we going to do it? And he goes, but the real questions is, are these. In his book, The Road to Peace, and yes, as i had this in the newsletter article. I think it's too good. It, it shouts too loud to me. What I would like to see you do is that you know that you are loved unconditionally. And the one who loves you unconditionally loves humanity unconditionally with the same all-bracing love. The perspective that God's love and God's love of us is so intimate and personal does not mean that God doesn't love anyone less or differently than he does us. Uniquely, yes. Probably my favorite paragraph out of the book, The Road to Peace. So, in some small way, maybe the person that you see every day, maybe it's the person you will see this afternoon and never again. Perhaps it'll be somebody that you will see across the street. Maybe it's the postal worker. Maybe you're the one on the other side of that counter. Maybe it's an auto mechanic. Maybe you're the one taking your car in. Maybe you're the one that does the IT programming and the other person is on the phone with a tech issue. Maybe you're the one that is out picking up trash Maybe you're the one that is trying to hide behind the trash. Maybe you're the one that takes care of the children during the day. Maybe you're the one that's dropping off a child. Perhaps you're a teacher or an administrator. You might be a nurse or a counselor. You might be a CPA. You might be an attorney. You might do children's ministry. You might do a wonderful job of playing the piano. You might be out there and realizing that your job is to fly a plane. Perhaps is to drive a truck. What does Christ ask of us? What does Paul encourage us to do? Hmm. 
to share God's love. For we are all loved. There are days and times we may not feel it, but may we know we are all loved. He loves us. He loves us uniquely. And Paul encourages us to partner together, not to divide or split or find reasons why we don't do it together, but together we go out to do this, the work of Christ, the saving grace for the sake of the gospel. So when we read things out of the scriptures, I hope you study these verses here in this ninth chapter. For it is standing on the glory of that Grand Canyon, the beauty of the colors and the, the panoramic view of what God has created. I hope you see it also when you look in a mirror. And when you ask yourself, what am I to do? Offer peace today. Bring a smile to someone's face. Say words of healing. Let go of anger. Let go of resentment. Forgive. Truly forgive. Love. Truly love. For these are the real questions. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh, gracious God, help me to know, feel, and see God's love. May I partner in sharing that love, the good news, with the people I know, those I have never met. May I stretch out to those living in circumstances I've never known and enduring events, good or bad, of which I've never experienced. Help me to stand up for justice, for equality, and to do so with dignity and respect, using only the weapon of your love and your living water. For I know, I know your love is all-powerful and everlasting. Thank you for your word and an abundance of love and grace for all. Yes, even for me. Amen.